Um, there you go. So Got it. Uh, before we started the recording, obviously, yeah, you were, you were talking there about, about, you know, how you've kind of jumped from the beginning of the pandemic to having 600 followers on YouTube to now having you know, 200,000, which is awesome. Um, congratulations on that. And but, the secret was telling the truth about coronavirus that the mainstream media won't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> that, isn't, that was a joke. That is not true. Uh, yeah, There's no, none uh, of that content on my channel. Um, no, well, obviously, there, you know, I've, I've been watching some of it um, over the last year and obviously, you know, how, how popular it's become. Um, one of the things we do ask artists and creatives to start off is... How do you define success? Because there's a lot of young people I get to work with now as part of my sort of day work, and they look at people like yourselves, and you might not think it's YouTube influence, but to a young person, you know, 200,000 is a big deal. And they go, oh, I'm never going to be like ABK. I'm never going to be a, you know, maybe they want to be a stand-up, <laughs> maybe they want to be yeah, a yeah. stand-up comedian. Maybe they want to be a YouTuber. Um, and they go, oh, I'm never going to get there. And they, you know, they, they, they lose that motivation. So what does success mean to you? Uh, as a performer, as a uh, person as well? Well, um, we went to university together. Mm -hmm. um, and pretty much since I've graduated, uh, since I left university, since I started work, my first job was washing pots and pans in the canteen of Norwich Union in York two days a week. And I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> but, but from that point onwards, I've mostly worked doing things that I'm interested in. Mm. Um, and as as the many, many years, I don't need to tell you how many decades have passed since then, as the years have gone on, uh, uh, more and more of the work that I do is work that I like or work that mm. is my own creative stuff. And that's success. I mean, I don't want to overstate the, the, the money I make, but it, you know, I don't want to imply that um, I'm rolling in it. I'm really not. But how many people get to get to work professionally most of the time doing something that they like and are and is the thing they want to do mm, mm. i think that's that's it for me now mm. i might not be doing it anywhere near as well as i would like or at the level i would like or with the remuneration i would like but i've been making a living out of doing my own stuff for yeah. years now yeah and that is that's that's good enough you know, there are the in you know in comedy and in the other creative fields, there's there is the equivalent of being the touring band that um that that plays all of the pubs, doesn't get radio play, doesn't do you know doesn't become an international touring band. You know, being a session being a session musician is a thing in every other creative mm -hmm. sphere. It's extremely rewarding and a worthwhile thing to do. Mm -hmm. You can and you can by all means work your socks off trying to break out of it but just doing the thing that you care about at a professional level is good mm. enough mm. Mm. I, be, I think. yeah i think that's something that certainly you know I, i've learned over the last year is you know being good enough is 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 good enough rather yeah. than trying rather than trying to be you know like like although to be to be fair you know like i say you look at your work and you know people i've been showing people your work for you know a long time now and uh, you know and, and, and people love it. People do really love it. And that must be, how does that feel to have, do you not, not just have people watching your videos, but people genuinely, I've read some of the comments, some of them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> don't read yeah, all the comments. Yeah, don't, I don't, don't read all, but it must, my, how, how, <laughs> what how is wrong with this guy's face? <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just how ginger people look. It's like, <laughs> there's nothing I can do about it. It's the, it's the it's the magical comments on your hair as well. People That's, love your yeah, hair. Yeah, there's a lot of hair comments. A yeah. Lot, someone comments drop hair care routine on every video. And you don't uh, have every any video idea. I've got. They repeatedly ask me to do the hair care routine video, yeah. which is like I don't have. You do, yeah, I read. I read. You just don't do don't do it at all. Do you? Just, I just wash it. Yeah. I just, yeah. I just wash it and then film the video that day. Yeah. That's the secret. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Which is nicest. I mean, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, yeah. I, I, the comments are nice and encouraging. I, I said I wouldn't envy people are re really personal because as soon as you're on the internet, you're treated like a stranger. Not not like a, people know the difference between a, a YouTuber with a small following and, uh, and and a celebrity, but at the same time, people feel like they can comment on quite personal things, which doesn't bother me. But it does make me think. I'm glad I'm not doing this when I was if I was younger or mm. a woman, for instance, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. uh, if I were. If, if my sense of self-esteem or worth was more tied to how I look than it is, mm. then that then that could be quite tough. 
Mm, mm, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, that's, you know, we'll talk a little bit about that and perception in a little bit, but I think, you know, I do wanted to ask, you know, talk me through, you know, you mentioned, you know, the start of the pandemic, you know, being there, you know, kind of, and things have really taken off for you. So what was, what did you do differently? Cause you've been doing stand up for a long time. You've had success there. You've uh, been doing the Edinburgh, you've done the Edinburgh fringe stuff. You've been, you've been working in media for a long time in video games and all that stuff. Why so did what, any of that work? Why? Did, why so much? So many years of failure. Well, no, <laughs> well, no, no, that's not what I'm talking. Because I think, I think success is well. I mean, if you look at the Nelly Coots a lot of stuff and being able to do that, that's amazing. The other stuff you've done, so I think it's great. But in terms of, I guess, social media clout, I guess the followers and all that. What, what, what was it? What do you think it was that that that, that changed? Um, I think it was just luck. Mm. So, in, in a, at the end of 2020, I was. Um, I was that was my lowest point in the pandemic. Okay, thing, the thing, you know, I, I'd uh, I had done a I'd done a, a who done it murder mystery on mm. Twitter, which had which mm. had gone quite nicely, and I picked up a mm. few followers from that. But that had been the that had been my only um, small scale hit in a sense. Mm. Since twenty, I'd been doing sketches on YouTube and Twitter since twenty nineteen. So I came mm. back from that was the last time I did the Edinburgh Festival, and I came back realizing. That for the second time i'd done quite a good show but it wasn't going to be a life-changing career-changing show because either the right people didn't come and see it or they did come and see it and they didn't like it enough you know okay, or yeah. they did come and see it and they liked it but i still wasn't cool enough to be ready for whatever opportunities they might have been able to put me my way yeah so i start i thought i better start just doing something else obviously you know you know that i did film so i um uh, I have a sort of um, I can do film and animations, which is, which is a bit of a cheat. It puts me slightly ahead of other comedians. But I was doing that before the pandemic, so when the pandemic hit, I started doing more things like that. And uh, and then it was January of this year. I did a video. I did a sketch about um, Scandinavian yeah. noir, <laughs> yeah. um, which is still by a long way my highest uh. viewed. Um, and most shared video. I mm. don't know why. I, mean, I think it's funny, but I don't. I don't see why it's that one and not a different video. You know that it seems. Um, I, that's why I do think there's a random element to it. I posted it on Twitter. I didn't even put it on YouTube. Somebody stole it from Twitter and put it on Reddit, um, right. and I'm glad they did, because uh, it it did very very well on Reddit. I mean, if I'd put it on Reddit and got all of those views, that would have been nice. But I, yeah. I didn't. I wouldn't have put it on Reddit. So yeah. didn't didn't know to do that. Um, so it went. It, for want of a better word, a bit viral, mm -hmm. and so I, so like I gained forty thousand followers on YouTube in that week. Um, I only put it on YouTube after it went on Reddit. <laughs> people were like, "Where's this person's YouTube channel?" So I quickly put it on YouTube. Amazing. Um, and um, and now it, so I say it's luck, and I think it is luck because those sorts of things are random. You can't make things go viral. I'm sure you've you've been in a position as a creative person where the <laughs> where the client says uh, we've got this idea and we really want it to go viral so we'll so does everybody but <laughs> like uh, you know a video of someone slipping on a banana skin might go viral whereas your whatever whatever specific message you're trying to go get across might not necessarily mm. not everything should go viral not everything can yeah. go viral yeah yeah Most you, things won't yeah and you can't pay for it as well like that's the thing people, it, no. yeah you can't buy it and i think that's that's a key message there you know i, I think that's it's really interesting it's nice to hear there's some organic the organic nature of it even though somebody else took your thing yeah yeah it's that's, that's why that's why i say random because mm. it's somebody else somebody else got all of those upvotes <laughs> i didn't but um luckily the the redditors in are funny are, are quite good at sort of finding out where things come from so mm. while it got hundreds and th thousands of views on there um, yeah but maybe no i think it got millions of views yeah yeah it's, um, it's a millions it's a millions now man and um, like i say it's, it's lovely many of them some of those millions a couple of those millions came through and watched it on youtube mm, mm, absolutely uh, so you, you mentioned um you know obviously being able to survive um as a creative as an artist through the comedy through youtube and stuff like that without go well going into as much detail as you're comfortable what what's that process like how do you you know because you've got so many different fingers in pies or certainly when i knew <laughs> when i knew you you had quite a few fingers in quite a few pies and yeah, you've they always call me johnny pie fingers yeah <laughs> very... 
so, so how does it work? How do you do it? How do you make it work? So there's, there's the youth, so I'm presuming uh, 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 an amount of YouTube income, your, your stand-up stuff. Fr frankly, I only I only switched monetization on uh, a month or so ago because a friend okay. said, what the hell? You haven't monetized YouTube? No so way. All of those no views. Way. Well, uh, uh, you have to get a certain number of followers. So the views that I got for um, the Scandi Noir, I don't think I was even able to monetize back when that mm. came in. So so um, so I'm not, making, I'm not raking it in off of YouTube dollar, partly because if a video is going to go badly, I want to feel sad just for that reason, not because mm. I also didn't make money. Mm. Um, but uh, but I have I have switched it on because I'm I've realised that I do need to uh, buy food and things. Yes, yes, it's important uh, yeah. at some point. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so I um I I it's a difficult question to answer because I've always done a lot of things. Yes, and I've always been a bit of a jack of all trades. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's bad, but it means that I've got uh, a a wide range of interests, I think, and a wide range of skills. But I'm probably not the best at any of them. But I might I might be one of the few people who can put them together uh, in in this way. You know, oh, that said, I mean, I know other comedians who work in games, and I know other comedians who do animation. But it's it's rarer. Mm. So um, so I, I wrote a video game, um, yes. it, which and I, I wrote an animated video game, which which released in um, 2016. Yeah. So that took a huge, huge amount of time and work. And I, I'd never quite priced up what time, how much the time I spent on it for absolutely no money would have been worth. <laughs> but I now have royalties coming in off of that game. Which are uh, which the publisher would be annoyed at me if I told you. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, what they are. Yeah, if if you know anybody reading this or listening to this will know that they haven't heard of this game, so it has obviously not been a smash hit. Um, but in the same, you know, in the same way that you probably haven't heard of my YouTube channel or seen my stand up, I can still it's still possible to make a little bit of money, you know, to get yes. on on, a, on a monthly basis to get a little bit in that that makes paying rent easier. Mm, absolutely absolutely i think that's important to, to to sort of the reason why i ask those questions obviously is quite a, a personal question is because I, I, one of the things we try and do is motivate uh people who want to get into creative industries like comedy like animation uh, like 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 making videos uh mm. we you know you can do it and you've you've struggled and you've and that's important to remember is you've worked your ass off for what you know, 20, for nothing yeah. so for, for <laughs> no, pennies for a long, for a long pittance. time, for a long time, but you've always <laughs> done it. Yeah. You did it regardless. You did it regardless of making of whether you were making money and you carried on. And now you're getting a little bit of, yeah, the social media clout, but you've always loved it. You've always done yeah. it for the love. So I suppose there's two things, isn't there? There's, there's look, and then there's continuing to do it because, mm. uh, because every time you post a new video, you give yourself mm. another opportunity for good luck to strike. Yes. There's an element, I suppose, of I guess you'd say privilege these days, because mm. um, because every because it's, all of these things are a risk. You know, uh, at any point I could take the skills that I have learned and try, I, I, and I could have tried to get a nine to five job that would have paid a lot better, and I could be putting money into a pension, getting life insurance, and doing all of those sensible things. Uh, and I, I I would be remiss if I didn't advise young people to do that because obviously that's sensible. Mm. But the the easiest quality to imitate in the successful people you admire is the thing that separates them from the people who quit, which is that they didn't quit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. and that's the and you can't you can't imitate the having the right parents or going to the right school or you can't you can't control all of those things. Mm -hmm. but the 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 only thing that they have in common is that they kept doing it. Mm. Absolutely. So you keep doing it. That said, I've done very different things. You know, I went to I went to film school. I was making short films. That didn't work. I started doing comedy and video games. I made a video game. It turned out to be horribly hard work. <laughs> I stick with the comedy, but hopefully, um, I'm I may be bringing different things that I've learned together at this point in in a way that well, yeah. it's working a little. It seems to be working a little bit better. Absolutely. I got to go on the TV, so that's all. Yeah. Right. If that's I, I... the highlight, then I'll accept it. Uh, absolutely. And we'll talk about some career highlights at the end. Um, but I think that's, you know, one of the things, you know, I wanted to ask, because you, again, you've been able to do so much uh, different stuff. I remember seeing you uh, in the studio at York St. John's, obviously they had what, what back then was, was, you know, good, good tech and you were working with that. But do you work in a studio? Like how, what tools do you need? So all these wonderful sketches you do, like the haunted house one, for example, looks 
amazing. And you know, the, the, you, some of them are some of them are look a little, you know, some of them look very different. Some of them look like they could be worked on in a massive studio. Some of them <laughs> you could you're probably doing in your kitchen. I don't know. But what what tools do you use? Um, and how do you make a sketch? What's the say the creative process behind every haunted house movie, for example? Um, that was that was quite a deliberate one because I decided because I we'd watched the Conjuring series of yeah. films um, because it was Halloween or, or, or Halloween was coming. I think I managed to release that one not on Halloween <laughs> like an idiot, and then on Halloween I didn't have a sketch and it's like oh could have could have waited, but um, so we'd watched the Conjuring films and I decided I wanted to do a a, a, sp a spoof of it, and uh, often I'll, I'll just sort of I think I was on the train I often try and get ideas out on the train um and so i knew i wanted to do every haunted house movie and i think usually there's just a point where i think of a joke and once there's a joke then i can write the rest of the sketch mm, okay. um, and i can't remember which one it was with that i think it was probably um just a joke about the housing market about the yes. fact that once they yeah. bought the house they can't sell it yeah. uh, or they can't buy they can't live anywhere else because they've already bought the house um, so just to try and do something about the the housing crisis as a sort of throwaway joke in it, I think was the idea that um, made me think, oh, right, yeah, there's a joke there. So And then I can have fun trying to match the aesthetic of those uh, sort of low budget. Yeah. Uh, what's the what's the aesthetic of The Conjuring? It's the, it's, it's an art house aesthetic that, uh, with a B-movie script, I think. So the look is very sort of washed out blacks and uh, quite... Um, quite moody and desaturated, mm -hmm. but the script is uh, is 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 pure pulp yes. ghost story. Yeah, but, but but with the but without the extreme schlocky violence that you usually associate with that in horror. So it's all very sort of PG thirteen, mm. which is what I like about it. So it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so trying to match. Sorry, I just started talking about the country films. No, no, it's fine. Uh, uh, yeah. But I, I did quite enjoy parts of them. Yeah. Um, but 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 the fun of it for me is also trying to match the aesthetic, or if I'm doing mm. animation, trying to do a pastiche of the animation style so mm. that it looks like the uh, not not that much like the real thing, but it looks as close to the real thing as I can yeah. Do, uh, do. Yeah, yeah, and, and the process uh, for building those things, you know, what kind of, you know, where are you where are you filming? You know, how, what 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 are the crews like? Do you is it a big is it's it a tiny. big job? It's minuscule, yeah. small right. to me. Um, okay. and, unless, um, except on the rare occasion where I've had somebody else who knows about, you know, someone else do some writing, like mm. in, in the Doctor Who one. I don't know enough about Doctor Who, so I got a friend to help me. Um, so, it, it, uh, and um, in the case of my animated theme tune, um, Lauren yeah, Owen love did it. The music and singing. Love that. But yeah. Obviously, I can't do music or singing. So, well, the thing. So, I'm in my studio flat now. It's a tiny little flat with one room. The kitchen's there. The bed is there. They're next to each other. It's not <laughs> ideal. Um, and so I filmed them all in this space on a green screen. It's Amazing. tiny um, because of lockdown. It, my girlfriend has been in the same space and just has to be quiet while I do it. I'm ex it's extremely annoying for her. Mm. Um, I use a, a Canon M100, uh, which is the cheapest mirrorless Canon camera. It's basically, I guess it's about as good as an iPhone camera, maybe in terms of quality. Except mm -hmm. I don't have an iPhone, so it's uh, it's a separate camera. It's got a flip around screen. It's basically a vlogger's camera, um, but it has face tracking and um, which is very useful if you're filming yourself because you need that for focus. And it's got manual controls over things like exposure, which the the more basic cameras don't. So once you, it's the absolute minimum you get. I got it reconditioned, so I didn't buy it new because I couldn't justify spending that much money so i bought it for about 250 quid i think nice oh wow and yeah. two uh two daylight soft boxes uh, again the cheapest available mm. um, and sometimes a clip mic going into my phone which is again a uh, maybe 15 quid mic um, wow. or maybe maybe this mic here which is uh, a sure mv7 which is oh, quite cool. expensive yeah but same. my podcast the podcast paid for that the mic nice that's good that's good. Um, I mean, it's not that expensive. Again, it's a. I think it's a two hundred quid mic, maybe one hundred eighty, something like that. Mm. Um, so that's m much more expensive. Yeah. Than yeah. The well, clip mic. Yeah. Well, thank thank you for letting me into your process because I, I know you know some people like to talk about it, some people don't. But I think that because of what you've been able to achieve with 
that setup, it makes it a little bit more real, a little bit more possible for, for other creatives. Um, yeah. So I, 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 on the one hand, I want to emphasize how cheap all of that stuff is and how mm. you don't need expensive kit to, mm. to do stuff. You, mm. you don't. On the other hand, <clears throat> on, the do, on the other hand, you do need something. You know, you do need time and space, you know, a room of one's own. It's not like there are no, it's not like there are no barriers to entry for making stuff that looks good. Yeah, uh, that said, obviously loads of my friends just film sketches on their phone without any, without bothering with green screen or anything else and then go viral. And mm. that's annoying because, <laughs> I, yeah. because I insist on doing something needlessly complicated when a lot, it turns out just jokes are enough. Uh, or the ability to act, but no, I'm not going to do it that way. I'm interested in it, the um, the way it looks as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man, absolutely. And I, I mean that you know, I, I, one of the things that stuck out for me there is you know you, you you're using the space that you've got. Your your partner obviously helps out in terms of she's being, incredible. Yeah. yeah, she does, and she does the, the sometimes does the hair and makeup on if there's female characters. And that's so, that's that's awesome. And yeah. my my best to your to your partner as well. I I I, I have. Uh, uh, of the same sort of problem where you, you're living in a house and you're making noise at ridiculous hours of night yes. say we're filming a podcast or whatever and you know they're, they're in the other room not sleeping not being able to sleep so yeah. I, I, I I applaud your, your partner for that um, talk about the writing as well because again some of the dialogue I, I've shown it to people that have never seen you before and they laugh I've laughed lots of our friends mutual friends have laughed at you in a positive way <laughs> La laughing with you laughing with you rather yeah, yeah. Oh, Alistair over the years so you mentioned writing on the train where do you write are you sat in your bedroom are you sat in that kitchen like where where do you need to go out do you need to be in a place specific places or can you just sit right there where you are and write some of this dialogue that has gone viral and has entertained millions of people i think i'm very lazy and bad when it comes to writing i'm very very slow I'm extremely strong um uh, when it comes to stand up the do, doing the videos has made me reevaluate that because I found writing stand up very slow because with stand up you um, you come up with an idea and then you have to try it out in front of an audience so it's mm. it's written sort of iteratively unless you're maybe George Carlin who just writes it all out as prose and then, uh, but even but even he then read it out in front of an audience and I imagine revised it um, it's uh, whereas doing videos is interesting because the investment is um, higher. And yet there's no revision. You don't get to test it out. You don't get to, get to do A and B testing on YouTube mm. where you try it on a small sample of people and then go back and revise it. There's no s test screenings. You just make something and then edit it and animate it or whatever, and then you put it out, and then you find out if it was a good idea, which I suppose is more like putting out a song or publishing a book um, or put, you know uh, uh, an article for a, for a magazine. You don't... Although, yeah, you... you the... Uh, what am I saying? Um, the doing the videos has made me realize because I've done a, maybe I suppose I've done a, a video or two a month sometimes a video mm. every week for some periods and one of the things that comedians talk about you know how can you write a new show every year is mm. a big thing in British yeah. comedy not, yeah. you know other other you know American comedy doesn't have that thing because it doesn't it isn't centered around the Edinburgh Festival but um, but British comedy is how do you write a new show every year? Well, a show is maybe 55 minutes long, 50, maybe let's say 52, including mm -hmm. the start and, you know, a bit of padding at the start and the end. Then all you need to do is write 60 seconds of comedy a week for the year and you've written a show. You know, that's sort of a, a, um, a bit of advice that comedians give each other without ever anyone really believing that that's how it works. Um, but I suppose I sort of did do that, I, you know, in every couple of weeks, writing a one to two minute long sketch mm. but in, in terms of time that I did write that amount of stuff. Now, it's not material that transfers to the stage, but it, it, it reali you, you realize that by making small incremental bits of work over the course of a year, it has built up. Yeah, probably not into an hour. Maybe I've got half, <laughs> half an hour's worth of but there's only half an hour's worth of good jokes in anyone's shows, I think. So um, definitely any of my shows. So, um, I don't have a, I'm not very good at working in a regimented way. Right. So I was writing, I've been, I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about it. It's not a finish yet. Uh, so I've been writing a, um, a book. Okay. A book. Um, okay. And that has been flipping hard because, because yeah. it's long, 
it's just so many words yeah um but i often write on the train or on the way to and from gigs uh, i walk around and talk and say things it's trying to get to the 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 uh, a premise or an angle that is the, the thing around the the kernel of the sketch or the kernel of the bit around which other things can be built yeah. and and with stand up it's often if that's a joke go out and say it if people laugh at that thing then you've got a little thing a little uh, cornerstone around which other things can be built yeah now i've seen more experienced stand ups and I've seen them go into new material gigs, not just with the little cornerstone, but having already started to build, you know, in every direction they can think of off the cornerstone um, and realizing that's probably the direction you need to go to as oh. you, as you, uh, as the pressure piles on, you yeah. know, as you, as you, if you're where they are in their career, you can't afford to just go out and to see if one line works. You need to go out and here's one line attacked from every possible angle you could imagine. And maybe none of them will work, but maybe if one of them works, then it's not just a line you've tried out. It's a whole, a whole beginning of a routine. Yeah. yeah. But I'm not there. I'm not there. So for me, it's, can I just find an idea that I think will work? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that goes on nicely to my next question in terms of not necessarily with the writing, but performing now stand up is, you know, you're used to, obviously you are used to stand, you know, doing the stand-up shows now and, and you, but you, you know, you, you're an animator, you're a filmmaker, so you're sat on a computer. Um, what is it, what was it like for you when you first got up on stage, you know, a while ago now, you know, what are the differences, the main differences between doing a sketch for comedy, you know, which you're controlling, you're sort of melding into what you need it to be, to going onto an unpredictable, into an unpredictable setting on tour as a comedian, um, talk me through the kind of differences that are there as a as a touring comedian to someone that you know is building those comedy sketches for a digital audience. Sure, I'll I'll just jump in and, and address a, a point in terminology. Um, yeah. I, it, people often talk about me touring, um, meaning going around the country doing gigs. Yeah. But in comedy terms, you're touring only if you're doing your own shows. Okay. In that context, yeah. so I'm not a touring comedian because yeah. okay. I don't have enough profile to tour. Um, I do travel around the country doing gigs, but there'll mm. be gigs, you know, these will be club nights with other comedians on the yeah. gig. And, and and very occasionally I might be previewing my own show or doing a show after the fringe. But uh, but it's not quite the same as when you see, you know, big name comedian on tour doing a national tour. Okay. So yeah. just to just to make yeah. sure I'm not yeah. claiming pretensions, um, the. Doing stand up is uh, very enjoyable. Mm. Um, I would recommend it as a, a pastime or an activity. It's um, arguably better than lots of other things. So I started doing stand-up having made lots of short films that nobody was interested in, that I couldn't get into film festivals. None of them were comedies. Maybe I should have thought to put jokes in them. And eventually, I, having been, been rejected, uh, whatever it was, the 14th time, uh, I thought, okay, well, I'll write a comedy and I'll do a bit of stand-up because I've always secretly wanted to, just as research in mm -hmm. how you write comedy, um, which I think was just an excuse to do it because I wanted to do it. Um, and it, it turned out to be a massive distraction. And it's only af only years later now where I'm coming back to trying to do scripted work, trying to make videos, trying to put the uh, the, the drama side of things or the film side of things back in. Mm -hmm. But stand-up, What's great about it is, um, and I think it's it probably beats every other medium, including things like live music, because you've still got to learn the whole song. <laughs> you still got to write, and th there's no you can't just go out there and say, "Is this lyric good?" But you yeah. can just go out and go, "Is this joke good?" Okay, I'll come back and you'll have a we'll have a routine about that. You can't just say, "Who likes this chord?" Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, maybe I'll go away and do something. In stand up, you can. And it's very, very cheap, especially if you live in a city, you can, um, you know, I was making, trying to make five and 10 minute long films and it would take months and months of animation. And they would, they would come out with as many mistakes as you would expect for a, from a new filmmaker, they, you know, showing promise, but not being perfect and nothing would come of it career wise. You know, you're just gradually building a portfolio. Whereas you can go to an open mic, you can sign up. And you could do five minutes of comedy and get immediate feedback on whether what you said was funny. Yeah. That day. Yeah. So you can, you can, uh, uh, and you know, comedians are obsessed with this. You can think of it that day. You can say it. And if it gets a laugh, you've got a joke. Yeah. And yeah. then 
not always. I mean, I, I've, I can't count the number of times that the thing that gets a laugh the first time you say it because of some magic combination of um, fairy dust and adrenaline is never funny again. Yeah. At least, or maybe sometimes not for not for months afterwards until you come back to it and go, that was funny, wasn't it? And then, then you realize that somehow you lost what was funny about it. But there's still the... Um, it's a very interesting way to to make things. Mm. And it's mm. one of the reasons I think why comedians... Um, I was talking to um, uh, comedian Garrett Millerick. Um, if you look him up on YouTube, he's been on Conan and done all sorts of fantastic stuff. And he awesome. was saying that he doesn't think comedy is a craft. He thinks it's an art. Sorry, he doesn't think it's an art. He thinks it's a craft, yeah. like cooking, um, which I, I don't think I agree with him. But but he's right that, you know, you're trying to elicit a, a physical response from people. You're trying to make them laugh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's not unlike trying to please people's taste buds. It, it um, I, I think he's being um, overly humble about what comedy is, because I think it's OK to be bad art. You know, you mm. don't. Ha it doesn't have to, nothing. Not everything has to be opera. Yeah, um, yeah. Or something I imagine is good, but don't know anything about. Yeah, is um, is it? Go on. Sorry. But no, I, I've lost. I think I've lost what I was going to say. Yeah. yeah. So stand up is doing live stand up in front of an audience is is very good, and very enjoyable, and yeah. uh, it never and it never goes badly, and nobody ever boos. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because you you can occasionally. I went to. Uh, not been to many stand-up shows, but I went to see. I went to a couple more recently um, after the pandemic, just you know, to experience you know local comedy shows mm. and stuff, just to experience something new after you know being able to go out again. And one thing that did strike me is exactly what you said. This guy was was checking with the audience, you know, mm. like like what did you think? Of, is that good? You know, what do you think of that? And people are like cheering and saying yeah, or you know, you know. Sort of... You can actually ask people, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, that... that sounds like maybe that was, that's probably something you wouldn't, and you'd have to be very confident or it would have to be f framed as a, a sort of new material yeah. night. I yeah, think, well, that, to get away yeah. with that. I, that was it, yeah. It was a new material thing, yeah. Um, but uh, but it's but there is still a certain looseness, and uh, and I mean obviously the audience knows that they're they're involved, which is why people think it's hilarious to heckle, and mm. uh, which mm. is it's not in general. But but the audience is part of it. A big and a big part of it, and yeah, you know, there are times when and it, it can be helpful, you know, if you, especially if you're trying like a very short joke or something. It's useful to know: did you not laugh because that wasn't funny, or did you not laugh because you didn't get the reference, or you yeah. didn't understand where the punchline was supposed to be? Because if if it's number two, then there's still a chance that it's funny, and I just need to rewrite it. But if it's number one, then it's dead. Yeah, yeah, and you can just yeah. ask people; it's nice. That's cool. It's an interesting. It, it is really interesting. It's you know good for me to learn uh, from you about this stuff as well, just because it's it's a fascinating world, especially if you come from <clears throat> again like bands and artists where you have to nail the song, and if you get a chord wrong or you miss time a beat, it you know it can ruin the whole thing. Yeah, exactly. You know? I mean, which is comedy is similar, but but <coughs> it's not it's not as bad as. It's probably, I guess it probably goes music and then magic in terms of like in magic, if you really mess something up, then everything falls apart. Yeah. And it's going to be hard to cover that up. Yeah. Um, in music, yeah. If you, if you hit a bum note, what do you, you just, everyone will hear it. Um, yeah. And in comedy, you just go, oh, I messed that up. And, and then everyone laughs at that. Yeah. Like you acknowledging that you made a mistake and then it's usually fine. But, yeah. but, but not always, because I guess the rhythms of uh, tension and relief are part of comedy so yeah. like it's funny that like if you, if you if you stumble over the words of a punchline everybody knows what you were trying to say but no one laughs yeah which yeah. i think it which always interests me because it sort of annoys me from a from a rational point of view because like well you understand you all you all understood what the punchline was yeah so why does nobody laugh and i think it's because the a mistake raises the tension and so so whatever the you know the, whatever the value of the tension that was already in the room from the setup is yeah the, the once you've made a mistake while delivering the punchline it doesn't cancel out it's just the sum of how the joke works is off now yeah and we're, we're still in the red and there's still tension remaining yeah 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 i don't i don't know if it's quite that's quite how it works but i think it's interesting to me that it isn't simply a process of communicating ideas to people which mm. maybe that maybe that would be obvious to everybody else, but it took me a while to realise that's not what's happening. It's not yeah. just that. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, yeah. you could just text everybody. Oh, Twitter, Twitter is the remaining thing, isn't it? Otherwise, you just put the words out there. 
with no context and see if they're funny. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I think the comedian that I saw had, you know, had a particular reputation on Twitter for posting one-liners mm. that would that would work in a digital context, and I, you know, it, it fascinates me. It really does in terms of the dynamics. Yeah, and there are written, there are one-liners that are that only really work written down as mm. well, and so so the, um, the one-liner comics tend to be brilliant on Twitter, but mm. of course they've got that question of, but is it going to work live in, yeah. in the room? Yeah. Yeah, are, are, you know, do you need to be able to actually see the word to, yeah. to get what the joke is? This guy had like a, a PowerPoint, like PowerPoint and stuff. So he was really almost like, so there was a visual accompaniment. It's uh, I'm trying to work out who it is now. I probably know whoever this person is. Def, definitely really interesting. Um, but but yeah, so um, what, what was it? so yeah, two or three questions now then to finish off because um, I am going to talk about your time in video games because I think it's important. I think uh, that 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 was a really cool. Uh, certainly for for me to see your progress in that even though you weren't necessarily viral at the time uh it's still <laughs> still really cool man to have made some video games and brought video games out into the world and and been a part of the writing process for other games but before that um again most of our interviews are sent around advice questions and we've already covered a lot of it but um you you do you went to uni at york st john's now york st john's you know, not necessarily renowned for bringing out, well, you know, like at the time, certainly for bringing out people of your time, you know, you know, you're now a, a viral comedy sensation, whether you like, <laughs> whether you like it or not. I don't think YouTube existed when we were like, Yeah, so yeah, exactly. Nobody had gone viral. Exactly. No, there was no such thing. You had to go into like a Usenet group to try and yeah. go viral in those days. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, you're, you've got a, you know, you've got a Wikipedia page now. You've got all this Have stuff. I? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I think that's really cool that the, the, not the Wikipedia page, but the fact that you came from York St. John's and you came from these areas where, you know, you're not, you know, you're in London now, but you, you weren't then. And yeah, it took um, me a long time to go to London. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think we work with a lot. So we all our key areas is sort of still York, Leeds, Sheffield, Manchester, Hull, so predominantly the north um, of England and working through those cities. And again, a lot of stuff still comes up for me, even less less so now than it did. But the question we get is, oh, how do you make a creative endeavour work in the north of England? How do you work in the media industry? How do you build, you know, a project uh, that, that is going to be successful financially and personally? Now, even though you're in London now, you do have roots and parts of your life in the north. And you started yes, your I'm career. Yes, I'm from the north. Yeah, yeah, Durham. So you started your, your career here. So... Do you think people can make it work anywhere or do you think it was advanta it's advantageous if you can afford to, to move to London? Uh, I, I've lived there. You obviously live there now. Um, if you could afford to do it, I think that's the key is yeah. that if you, you know, it has to be something you can afford, but if not, if you can't, and those are the people we're speaking to, those are the people that we work with, the people that just don't have those resources and yeah. they go, well, I need to move to London, right? I need to go to uni in, in Manchester, right? I need to move to America, Los Angeles, yeah. Boston, right? So is it possible to do it from your experience in the North and make it work? Or what, do you have an alternative perspective on that? Uh, I, um, it, yeah, it isn't a straightforward yes or no answer. I'm very aware that what I ought to have done is move to London a lot sooner right. than I did. And I don't regret not doing that at all. Mm. Okay. Uh, I, so I don't regret my time in York. I, I, I moved to London to, to go to the London Film School, mm -hmm. where I did an MA after, mm -hmm. after studying film in York. Um, I continued to study film, um, uh, which was, again, which is, is also something that I don't regret, but I can't say necessarily that uh, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't neatly segue on to where I am now. I can't yeah. argue that this was yeah. a series of brilliantly plotted um rational choices as I, <laughs> as I moved in a, a, a pincer movement towards my goals. It, it, it was very much um, following what I was interested in at the time. I, I think it depends on what you want to do. It, there are definitely advantages to being in uh, London or Manchester. Of course, mm -hmm. if you're in Manchester, you'll all be, always be wondering if you should move to London. And if you're in London, you'll always be wondering if you should leave London because it's horrible. That isn't really true. Uh, I really like living in London, but if you if you live in London, and you don't have to commute during rush hour. Yeah, it's very nice, and yeah. I don't have to commute during rush hour. Uh, if you live in London, you have to commute during rush hour. It's not so not. It, it, yeah. That is a a big big negative. So I, 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 I can't I I but I can't stress how how much of a traitor I am to the north in that I do enjoy London. Yeah, and and one thing that people from the north need to appreciate is that 
that London is the left wing bit of the South. In the North, especially in Yorkshire, we te- tend to imagine that London is is the home counties, mm. whereas you know, the do- the, it's a donut of Tories around London, and London is full of poor people and yeah. rich people. Mm. Um, but but the um, yeah the the idea that London is this incredibly sort of uh, posh Tory voting place it's not, it's not what London's like yeah. at least not in the places where you'll be afford able to not in the places where you will be able to afford to rent if you move yeah. to London so yeah. don't worry about that. However, especially the last few you know the last year or so of everything being shut down and all of the advantages of London having vanished. Mm. Uh, I'm also discovering that almost everybody I meet thinks I don't live in London, which means that right. the advantages of actually being proximate to London aren't really worth anything if everybody thinks you live in Scotland because of your hair. Ah, uh, yeah, good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. yeah, but Glasgow, I suppose, would be another. Glasgow and Birmingham, I suppose, are the other sort of big city alternatives, yeah. moderately yeah. big. Um, I like Glasgow a lot. Glasgow's good. But um, video games are the one where, is, is video games the one where I think you can really do it. Yeah. In as much as it's very hard to make a living as a solo dev, you know, Mm. as a small team, but Mm. people do it. You can, it has its, like any industry, it has its problems, Mm. but you, you can build a cottage industry. Yeah. Making video, video games or producing art or writing for video games as a freelancer. Yeah. Uh, And you don't, because these things all happen at the end of a computer, you don't, you could be anywhere to do it. The same is true with YouTube. Yes. You know, you, you don't need to be anywhere in particular to, to do these things. Mm. And, um, and so that's, that pleases me because the, yeah, I, I like you would be pleased to see, uh, greater investment in terms of money and cultural capital, if, if for want of a better phrase in different parts of the country. Like, I mean, you know, I grew up in County Durham yes. and I wanted to work in television I think, you know, I, I don't know what I wanted. I think I wanted my own chat show when I was a kid, <laughs> um, which I don't now. But I remember sort of looking into what 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 is made in the northeast, and it was Look North and Biker Grove, and that was it. <laughs> yeah. And everything seemed so very far away mm-hmm. because it was. It was all happening in London. Yeah. And there's a bit more variety now. The parts of the BBC have moved to Manchester, um, but also. You can you can shoot your own stuff at home now. You don't you know you don't need to be uh, commuting to Soho yeah. in order yeah. to make an animation. It's not necessary. Or yeah. where would it be that now commuting to East London to mm-hmm. work on an animated film? You can make an animated film of your own at home with a computer that is not free but relatively cheap. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that I think is a positive thing. Mm-hmm. However, yeah. I would emphasize that London's not that bad. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I loved, I loved living in London, but I was living there the days before Uber and Uber, and because I, because I, <laughs> yeah, I fear, yeah. I fear the underground, so I did a two-hour commute in the morning. Oh, uh, yeah, blinking heck, wow. A year, and then I went back, and then I went back again and did the same thing. So yeah, not, 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 not great, um, but, but good, a lot, a lot of good times and a lot of good memories, and I think, yeah, you, you can make it work. I, mean, I think that's what I'm hearing from you is that. It, it it helps being there sometimes, but these days, more than say ten years ago, fifteen years ago, uh, you can do things anywhere. Yes, yeah, I mean you absolutely have to deal with the, you have to be prepared for the the self importance and the snobbery of <laughs> the London media world, which ignores yes. absolutely everything that happens outside of London. Yes, you you uh, it's it's very annoying as a northerner living in London, and mm-hmm. all you have to do is. Uh, try, I guess, not to be absorbed into it mm-hmm. while mm-hmm. you're here. Um, but if you're working outside of London, then you just have to be prepared for that. Although the weirdest thing, the weirdest thing was sort of meeting comedians from Manchester and discovering that I am a London comic in their eyes. Yeah, I, I don't think I'm a London comic. I don't yeah, know, because I just live here. I'm not from London, but yeah. because because the rules of how you start stand up are different in different parts of the country. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the 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 first couple of years are quite different. Like, because in London it's very busy and mm. you can't get more than five minutes on any open mic. Right. Okay. Um, whereas in most of the rest of the country, people start out doing tens, which doesn't sound like a huge difference, but 
I'm trying to think of what the analogy would be. It's somehow doing a 10 is, is when you're starting, it's more than twice the amount of work. It, mm. As you as you develop, it becomes less than twice the amount of work. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. you could just take five minutes of jokes and then add little bits to it to make it bigger. Yeah. But yeah. It's a big, big difference. And so London sort of trains people to be uh, very sharp and just get in there. Whereas uh, Manchester, or if you start gigging in, York, in Yorkshire or uh, Glasgow or Edinburgh, mm. Or any other place, mm. Wales, yeah. Um, then you're likely to get a. You know, it's it's. I'm sure it's not the case that they they produce storytelling comedians and anecdotal comedians. But if you were a storytelling anecdotal comedian, it'd be easier to start with a ten than than a you know a one liner comedian. But happy with a five. I'll just go in there yeah. and do do my one liners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then that, and then when the time up there, obviously. You know, it always feels, you know, it might be a 10 minute slot, but it can, you know, can it like can feel lifetime. anything between three and 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Um, a couple more questions before we finish. Uh, like I said, thank you so much for spending so much time with me today. It's man. been lovely. Um, I, I do want to talk about your, your games. I do want to talk about Nelly. Did I, yeah, did I change the topic there? Sorry. <laughs> no, yeah, no, 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 no. I, I was the one that did it because I wanted to talk about your, your experiences and, and uh, you know, like I say, I, I'm sorry. I know it's like an hour now, and, and you've probably got. Oh no, really, it's fine. It's fine. I was late as well. But we started, uh, at, we started at ten minutes past because my internet broke, so it's not a problem. <laughs> it's all good, man. Uh, we uh, we will talk about uh, projects that you, you know, can tell us about at the end. But um, yeah, I, I think it's it's important to touch upon some of your other successes. In my eyes, you know, being doing Nelly Coot a lot, and obviously, you know, writing for unforeseen circumstances, and and having the games work that you've done. What what was that like? You know, to take me back and, and talk about that work and how much that means to you now, because you left that, you left the gaming stuff to become, to focus on comedy, to focus on this part of your life, the sketches. I suppose so. I, um, I, I, yeah, I, I am in theory um, uh, contributing occasionally to other games with right, writing okay. at the moment, although okay. practically speaking, I haven't done anything for the last few months. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the uh, yeah. So the the backwards team that made unforeseen incidents. Um, I'm I'm yeah. supposed to be helping them with uh, other games that they're working on. Mm. However, I'm not. I'm doing really badly at that. So I feel very guilty. Um, about being busy. So I um I've always been a huge fan of point and click adventure games. It was my you know I play video, video games of all kinds, but I but I really liked point and click adventure games, and I was in the. Uh, the the amateur um homebrew gaming scene uh, when we were at university around turn of 2000 yeah, yeah. Uh, and i made a video game and uh and a few people from that you know from the forums from that world of of uh, uh have broken out and uh, and in in some cases been very successful mm. um like uh I, I if you've played any of the watch i games by dave gilbert yeah. like um you know the Blackwell series mm. or um, Unavowed recently. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's got to be one of the best reviewed adventure games for years. You know, awesome. uh, mainstream gaming press going, "Oh look, a good point and click adventure game." What? Yeah. yeah, we don't like we don't review these games. They're bad, but this one isn't. <laughs> yeah, um, which happens every every single time someone produces a good a point and click adventure game. People go, "But this genre is bad and dead." Yeah, and then and then another one comes off, and they're, they're like, "What?" But this genre is bad. It's like, it's. I feel like it's like horror movies must be in that same thing. Like they're consistently, you know, horror movies have always made more money. But in in the in as much as there's no respect, you can't get no yeah. respect for for a horror movie, no matter how popular they are. Yeah, uh, and they're never going away. Point and click adventure games have been um, dead. People have been declaring them dead for the, for the last thirty years now, and mm. consistently people are still making them and playing them. Yeah, yeah, um, and. Uh, so I, I made one, um, although mine didn't necessarily prove that they were still alive. Um, but uh, but if you've played it, it, it's um, it's it's better than you'd expect. I think it's um, I think it's uh, quite a nice little adventure game, and the people who have played it tend to like it. Mm, mm. Um, I was very happy to work on Unforeseen Incidents because um, it wasn't my project, so I, yeah. I co-wrote it with the lead dev, and it's nice to in a way be. In a position of and, and i've done that on a few other games since then some mm. of them still in development that's a very nice position to be in because in a way it, it, this isn't uh this isn't my passion project my job is to try and make this person's idea better in any way i can mm. and that might be 
giving honest feedback about things that I don't think will work, or it might be just punching up jokes or yeah. um, look, looking at story stuff and thinking, okay, well, is the, is it more exciting if we, if we t turn that reveal into something that happens at the start? So we have this information all along. So throughout this bit, the player is going to be wondering about what the outcome is going to be. Is that going to be more dramatic yeah. to, to do sort of essentially script editing stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that that sort of um, uh, I guess it's the I guess it's stuff that I have learned at film school by making all of those mistakes in short films by my, by by telling stories wrong time time and time again. It's nice to be able to look at a script and go, "Oh, you're making some of the same mistakes that I've made." Maybe yeah. uh, without claiming to be an expert, maybe I can help you by just shuffling these lego bricks around a little bit mm, mm. yeah it's interesting like because I, I i'm just getting into point and click which is a weird thing so i'm gonna you know gonna, gonna spend a bit more they're not time. dead dom they're no, not dead well, well I, I played so so our comics editor uh, uh graham he um he insisted that we do uh a uh, sort of a, a play uh, sort of play along to broken sword oh, and classic. yeah uh, york-based developers as well, well and a york-based developer yes yeah and so I started well, doing that. Been, I think they might have been based in Hull or Scarborough yes, they when they were a Broken Sword. <laughs> Not to be a giant geek. No, was it no, Hull? they were Hull. They were Hull first, then York, then and then I, York. I believe one of them still is in Hull. Mm. Um, but but it's yeah, interesting point uh, that you know going back to what we were talking about earlier. But I'm I'm getting into it now, man. So I'm going to go back because I was looking at um, unforeseen incidents yes. and. Oh, like, and you should. I mean, you should uh, if you haven't interviewed Charles Cecil. Uh, I'm, he's, I'm, 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 I'm in process. I'm in process. Yeah, I'm in. I'm in process of trying. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Fingers crossed. But, but yeah, um, it's just nice to get your viewpoint on that because again, I think you know, like I say, you've moved away from that now into your you, the comedy and the stand-up. But it must have been, you know, such a huge part of your interest and your taste. You know, because you, you played Nintendo and then obviously, you know, having being able to have games release, you know, for that and. Uh, it must be such a big part of your life, even though, you know, you don't look at it as necessarily a, a renowned success. Uh, it was such a beautiful part of your history and taste to be able to release video games. and Yes. Video games I mean, I think games are fantastic. And I still help to organize, well, I help to organize an event, an event called Adventure X, which uh, brings together narrative game developers. Oh, However, we haven't done it for the last two years. Fantastic. for obvious reasons yeah that would normally have um have happened just a few weeks ago in november we normally do it nice um uh and that's you know it's a yearly event for the last the last year it was we held it at the british library in, in conjunction with the british library and, and we get people like charles cecil mm -hmm. um to to come and talk about making games and i i mean i'm, I'm just I, I like i like stories and jokes and characters and interactive stories have always appealed to me yeah, and um, and actually, the 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 muscles that you're using are not that different mm. from stand up. So if you're, you know, if you're trying to, so for instance, this year for the first time, I got to go on Mock the Week, yeah, yeah. Uh, three times, which uh, which is three times more than I'd been on television. No, I've been on television zero times. So so it's infinitely more times than I've been on television previously doing stand up. Yeah. Um, and so what do you do? It's the, it's the weekend before the recording is on Tuesday and you've got newspapers or in front of you on the computer or, or whatever. There are things that are going to be in the show and you have to try and think of something funny to say about them. Now, mm -hmm. this is something that topical comedians deal with every week, but I, I don't. Yeah. Now, when writing for Unforeseen Incidents, for instance, um, it's a point of click adventure game. So we have a character in his hometown. Um, surrounded by beautifully created artwork that delightfully I didn't have to make. And so I get to sort of explore it for the first time like a player would and look mm -hmm. at things. And so we tried to we tried to make sure that the the way the character interacts with the environment mm -hmm. is is going to help the story. And it's the same sort of thing. So you're looking at uh, an old armchair in the in the local pub. And he has to have something to say about it. It's the same thing about look, the, you know, you pull the new a new story. This new story isn't funny, mm. but you have to think of something funny to say about it. So, mm. the armchair reminds him of uh, some drunken night out with his friends, or there's a stain on the armchair that means he'll never sit in it because he knows what caused it. Or some. Yeah. So we what we said, me and uh, Marcus, the developer, is 
in when he's in his hometown, everything everything we, you look at pretty much is going to tell you something about his yes. relationship to town because he's very familiar here. When he ends up in the big city, he's a small town guy. He hates the big city. And right. so, all, so all of the seemingly neutral things in the big city irritate him because they're yeah. all big city. Yeah. And whereas in the hometown, everything, wherever possible, everything has a little bit of a story attached. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. his reaction, every time he looks at something, it tells you something about his character or it tells you something about history or it mm -hmm. tells you a joke. Mm -hmm. it's, he's just got a funny thing to say about it. You know, if yeah. you can think of a joke, brilliant. And it's the same muscle in a way yeah. of, well, here's a long list of things and I've got to say something about every one of them. Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, not that different. It, it's interesting to kind of, yeah, to kind of break it down like that, actually. Yeah. Because again, with the point and click stuff, everything has, uh, you know, it's the detail. And, and it, it, you know, you as a player, you're like, wow, they've, they've thought of everything here. There's something for the chair. There's something for the bar. There's something for the carpet. Let's, let's be honest. Sometimes they haven't. You know, the number of games that I've played where you click on the, the car and the character says, it's my car. And you realize this is. You're yeah. writing for a game in 1989 where there weren't yeah. enough pixels to make the objects clear. And so yeah. they needed text to explain what they were supposed to be. Yeah. So you would click on three pixels and it would say, it's the phone book. That was necessary. But now we can see that it's the phone book and you can add something else with the character's yeah. response or yeah. get rid of the character's response altogether. I mean, there's wonderful games like um, uh, the... Uh, the Outer Wilds, mm. where which are sort of exploration based, which is mm. sort of the the descendants of Mist, I suppose, um, but have somehow you know not, uh, have surpassed and built upon the the concept of Mist. So, arguably, it's like Mist but enjoyable. It's absolutely <laughs> genius what they've done. Yeah, there's some amazing that stuff, out, amazing stuff out there, man. And it's lovely to talk to you about this stuff as well, um, just because again, it's something I'm just getting well, into. But I like, it. and I, I started out by saying that I'm a jack of all trades and um, master of none is the other part of that, and maybe that's true. But I, I never understand the, I never understand people who are only interested in one thing. Mm. You know, there are mm. people who are like it's just it's stand up comedy, it's stand up comedy, it's stand up comedy. It's like, well, what do you write about? Um, or films, you know, people who only watch films, like, well, are books not a potential inspiration for films? Are other <laughs> things it does it is film not in conversation with other media? Um, yeah. obviously, we have our passions, but but why would you be why who is who is really only interested in one thing? Mm. I understand the career advantage to focusing on one thing and just going for it, yeah, but. I have enjoyed simply doing whatever interested me. Yeah, I love that, man. And I love the fact you can make it work uh, and you have made it work doing everything you've ever wanted to do. Uh, and, and I think that's a wonderful example, which is... Well, that's a really good way of putting it, actually. When I was a kid, yeah. I wanted to make video games and be a comedian. Yeah, and there you are. And, and now I am. And this I'm, is, you know, I could do it with some more money, but as it is, I yeah. am those things. I do. Yeah, them. man. I love it. And that's why we wanted to speak to you today. And, and I think it's, it's bloody, I love it. I love it. I, I, I'm, I'm feeling proper motivated by it. Like le legit. It's nice to see you again. Right. Um, before, before, okay. So yeah, a couple more, we'll do the promo of the press and the plugging for other projects in a minute. Um, but I do want to ask you this. Um, I do want to ask you about career highlights. Now one would assume you're going to say mock the week. One would assume you're going to say viral success with your videos and, you know, the, the sort of the having the Wikipedia page, the fame and all that stuff, whatever. <laughs> um, but but you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna that, that's my assumption. Those are my assumptions, and I'm aware of that. So I'm gonna ask you, what are your career highlights? What means the most to you when you when you're gonna die, if in the, in the distant future? What is it you're gonna look back on and be like, holy shit, that was uh, part of my language. That was you know that was amazing. I did that. That's cool. I really appreciate the way I said part of my language to myself on my deathbed. Yeah. in my head I, yeah. I like that that's classic me uh, <laughs> to be like holy shit pardon my language uh, i'm glad to die here um so it, it it seems it seems ungrateful or maybe even uh like false modesty to say that the the weird thing about uh achieving anything or, or achieving any landmark what's the word milestone milestone like getting to do a uh, you know a tv panel show as soon as you've done them, they they sort of dissolve into thin air, and it's like, oh, well, what? Because you realise that, uh, you know, oh, yeah, I'm doing this for the first time. But then you look around the panel, and it's it's not a huge deal for everyone else in the panel because they've yeah. got loads. Of, you know, they've they're looking towards their 
national tour or the the maybe their sitcom pilot that just got picked up or what or whatever it is you know and you, you so every achievement suddenly dissolves and um, mm. becomes completely meaningless which is why you can have people doing much much better than you look, looking around and going oh my career's going nowhere you know the, you just can't get ahead as a white man these days or whatever <laughs> those things are. it's like yeah. but you are ahead we, yeah. we all cry but you're doing fine but it, it's easy to be unaware of the, um, uh, you know, how far you are up the ladder. You're just looking upwards and seeing how much further there is to go because there's no upper limits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you have you have to try and remind yourself of uh, of the fact that you you know you're not on the bottom. Yeah, uh, you have made some progress. If I suppose if I'm honest, the um, those things are milestones. But I I regularly find myself slightly dissociated from my uh, body and personality. So every, every so often I see my reflection and I'm surprised that's me. Yeah. Um, which yeah. has always happened and I'm used to it. But a, a similar thing happens just before going on stage sometimes. Because before you go on stage, a compare will essentially lie to an audience and say how brilliant you're going to be. It's not like in America yeah. where they do it for about 40 minutes and they read all of your IMDb credits and everything. Like you'll recognize him as waiter number three. For, it's not like that, but they do say this next act, very good friend of mine. They'll say that even if they've just met you, it yeah. doesn't make any difference. You know, yeah. a, a great comedian, and, and they'll build big you up. And every so often, I have a sort of a moment of um, dissociation at that moment when they describe yeah. me as a comedian because I remember that I am. Yes, yeah. I am a comedian, and I still feel anxious about saying that. It feels weird doesn't seem right you know like i'm definitely less funny than some people but i i can write jokes i suppose and i but even if you don't think i'm funny at all i am a comedian yes it's yes, you are oh no i am it's, it's unarguable yeah yeah and so so i guess it's that it's that feeling of going oh yeah i am i may yeah. not be a great comedian like the guy said and we may not be close personal friends <laughs> as as the mc implies yeah. but i am actually doing it yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. And that, and that that is the big message we want to get across with this stuff is that you are doing it. And that example is there. And as long as you do it, you are it. You know, yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of talk, um, especially when you start comedy. It's like, when can you call yourself a comedian? Because obviously yeah. there's people who do one open mic and then change all their social media handles to be uh, comedian Jeff. Yes, yeah. Okay, and that is a little bit poserish. Uh, but, you know, and, and of course there are scenesters and posers in yes. throughout the media, of course. And... Um, there is i think quite a strong divide with people who want to do the thing and people who want to be seen to be doing the thing yeah but it, we, we if you know if we're saying you've got to be making 100 percent of your income from comedy or you can't call yourself a comedian or whatever it is yeah it's like well by these measures like william blake isn't a poet and yeah. uh, 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 and van gogh isn't a paint you know it's like you, there are people who there are there are geniuses and probably more women who i haven't heard of because of yeah. sexism yes who were who were absolute geniuses the, yeah. the brilliant most brilliant minds of their time and they were not famous at the time yeah. because that's not a very good measure of who's a genius yeah and well, that it's okay you can't we can't really do much about that on an individual mm. level but mm -hmm. you can the w one thing you can do is if you're making the thing if you're doing paintings you can call yourself a painter if you're doing comedy you can call yourself a comedian it's absolutely. accurate yeah absolutely man and that, that is again a great message uh before we get yeah, this is it uh the promo question the, the press uh question now uh if you've got anything what what are you working on um what do you what can you tell me about because I know there's the stuff you can't tell me about. What, what are you working I don't on? Know, do I, wanna... I don't know. I, I don't. I just think the the. the so I'm, I am writing a kids book, but it's yeah. not. Uh, it's a long way from finished. Okay. So so it's on a first draft, and uh, it's not going to come out for over a over a year, I think. So yeah. it's I, so it's not at a plugging point really. Okay. So there's no okay. point talking about it, okay. and I don't think I'm obliged. I don't think I'm. It's not NDA or anything. I am allowed to talk about it. It's just. It's just not yet a thing yet yeah okay okay so you've got your you've got youtube where you're putting out videos uh obviously your twitter people can follow you there uh do you do you have any links and things that you want to directly oh, plug um well there's uh, i do a podcast called lawmen okay uh, cool. with james yep. shakeshaft and that is uh quite regular at least it has mm -hmm. been since lockdown we've been doing mm -hmm. it every, almost every week 
mm-hmm. and that is about folk the folklore mostly of the British Isles. We mm-hmm. sometimes have guests, uh, but it's mostly it's just uh, two white men doing a podcast. What? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Someone finally did it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So people could check that out. That's awesome, man. Uh, so please check out Lawmen, and um, I will probably be back at the Edinburgh Fringe. I would, I hopefully, I'll be back at the Edinburgh Fringe next year, but cool. I don't know yet. Oh, um, cool. uh, I don't. Uh, Leicester is not quite northern enough, but I'll, I'll be at the Leicester Comedy Festival in February. Nice um, one, man. Doing two dates. Awesome. Well, next time you're up, up, up north, Yorkshire, whatever, you know, I'd love to love to spend some time with you in in the real world. Um, yes, that'd be lovely. Yeah, definitely. And, and thank you so much. I do want to just. I n- normally when I ask this question, I realise I'm going to put you on the spot here because your partner's uh, n- nearby. But what I like to do is I like to ask. Um, well, is it, what would you like to say to the people that you know from the very beginning? You know, you you. Uh, you know, I've known you for a long time. And you had people supporting you back at YSJ, and obviously you have lots more people supporting you now. So to those people that have got behind you, uh, whether they are family, whether they are partners, whether they are followers of you on YouTube and your social media platforms, what are the, what is the message uh, that you have for those people that have supported you in your career so far and will continue uh, to do so? Uh, can I have some more money, please? <laughs> cool. cool. Is that all right? <laughs> yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's, it's a joke answer. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Brilliant. Well, um, Alistair, ABK, it's a pleasure, man. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dom. It's been lovely. Brilliant, mate.